there's a, a fairly well-known painting titled Marsh Hawk, which is painted by the American uh, painter Andrew Wyeth. The auction house Christie's valued it at over $1.5 million in 1997. There's no telling what it's worth today. But as you, as you look at it, there's a few things that catch your eye immediately. You might notice the, the browns and the golds in terms of the coloring in the foreground or perhaps the blue that stands out on the wagons in the middle or maybe even the white on the farmhouse in the background. What also might catch your eye is, is Wyeth's style of realism or perhaps the lighting. You would see it's kind of dark in the front and then light in the middle that seems to be coming from a sunset, lighting up the wagons, lighting up the corner of the house. That's all fairly obvious, but what isn't readily apparent is why the painting is titled Marsh Hawk. So, quick lesson in Art Interpretation 101. Often a, a skilled painter will, will lead you from the focal point of the painting around the painting or toward something in particular to which he also wants to draw your attention. In this particular painting, notice the way that the wagons are kind of pointed in one direction and how there's almost a trail of light that leads you to the far edge of the painting. Now, believe me, I know this is incredibly hard to see, right? (laughs) But if you were looking at the actual painting, you would notice on the far left edge of it, a bird sitting on a short fence post, more specifically, a marsh hawk. Now, a casual observer can appreciate many of the more obvious aspects of the painting, but until you see the marsh hawk sitting on the fence post at the far edge of the scene, you really haven't seen what Wyeth wants you to see in a similar way in today's passage, we will see the fall of Haman and his rather dramatic demise. These are the more obvious aspects of the passage, but not the ultimate point. We need to be more than just casual observers to see how these more obvious focal points direct us toward what the author really wants us to see. Now, our main theme this morning is that God preserves his people against sin and evil at any cost because of his covenant love for them. God preserves his people against sin and evil at any cost because his covenant love is upon them. Now, our passage just kind of naturally breaks out into two sections, as you can see if you're looking at Esther 7 in your Bibles. First, we're going to look at a confirmation of a biblical warning in verses 1 through 6. That is, be sure your sin will find you out. And then second, we'll consider the sober biblical exhortation in verses 7 through 10. Take heed lest you fall. Our passage is Esther chapter 7. Hear then the word of the God who demonstrates covenant love to his people. So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold 
I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Then King Oshawara said to Queen Esther, Who is he? And where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, A foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. As Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was, And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence, in my house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. And the king said, Hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. So Spirit, lead us now. Please, open our eyes so that we might see what you desire for us to see this morning. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So as we've walked through Esther, it's been fascinating to just let this Holy Spirit-inspired story basically tell itself. We've seen beauty and drama, humor and irony, as well as both dark, very dark, and redemptive themes. Now, we've just turned the corner here in Esther in terms of the storyline. So today's scene takes on a a very serious but, but also just a thrilling theme, namely God's defense of his people. Now, if you were here last week, recall that the entire book of Esther is written as a large chiasm, which is just a literary device. It it sounds super complicated, but it's actually very simple because the Greek letter chi is just the letter X. So the main idea is that whatever is at the center of the literary structure is the main point, whether that's a phrase or a verse or a chapter or a whole book, right? What is before the center parallels what is after the center, just in reverse order. Now, the last thing that we saw before the center point, which was chapter 6, was Esther and Haman and the king at a banquet. So if the second half of the book is parallel, just in reverse order, we would expect to see Haman and the king and the queen at another banquet coming out of that central idea, which is precisely what we see in verse 1. Now, not surprisingly, at this point in the book, the king and Haman are drinking again. And the king is is basically back to his bloviating in verse 2. What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted to you, even to the half of my kingdom. Blah, blah, blah. He has no intention of giving Esther half his kingdom. Right? <laughs> but the background music changes in verse 3. And the tone is completely different. Everything has been leading up to this exact moment. The queen identifies with her people for the very first time in the book in verse 3, and she reveals the plot against them in verse 
four, they are going to be destroyed, to be killed, to be annihilated. But this scene is just, just tailor-made for the movies, right? So you would just cue camera two for a close-up of Haman's face here. For the precise moment, he realizes exactly what Esther is doing. Let's kind of hold camera two there, but then go split screen. So the king says to Queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? And Esther said, a foe and an enemy, this wicked Haman. So back to camera two, zoom out, stay on Haman. Epic background music crescendoing, pan out slightly, capture everyone's expression, hold it on Haman, and cut. Haman's tragic life is a parable of Numbers 32, 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. It's such an interesting phrase. Be sure your sin will find you out. What it essentially means is that sin exposes our hearts through our actions. And then sooner or later, sooner or later, the consequences of those actions will be revealed. For example, Haman's exaggerated pride led to his hatred of anyone who did not bow down to his idol of self-importance and reputation and pride. When Mordecai refused to show Haman honor, Haman's actions exposed his idolatrous heart. Haman's sinful response to Mordecai's perceived slight was to commission the construction of the ridiculously tall gallows so he could shame and destroy the man who refused to fall before him in honor. Then the full consequences of Haman's sinful actions came to bear on his own head in an ironic and in an horrifying way. But, but let's not let Haman's fate go unexamined. We would do well to consider Haman's error even in our own lives. So consider what sin may simply be in seed form in your heart or life at the moment. Maybe it's just an initial thought or consideration. It could be something perverse. It could be doubt in the greatness and goodness of God. Maybe it's just starting to become more prevalent in your thoughts or beginning to consume your thoughts. Now that seed is turning into a weed. But if that's true, remember that we are commanded to take every thought Every thought captive to obey Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's how we avoid Haman's error. Our sins may not be as obvious or as overtly murderous as Haman's, but their presence and, and sin's progression leads to essentially the very same end. Recall the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. You, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. 
and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. So think Haman. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. Now, think about the person who looks back at you from the mirror. According to Jesus, even even small-scale sins that may not stand out to us as especially grievous, they still, they still expose our hearts and they ultimately end in essentially the same place of eternal consequence. That is sobering. So, if we can be sure our sin will find us out. And if, as the Apostle John said, none of us can say we are without sin, then how is it even possible? How is it even possible to live without a paralyzing fear of pending judgment just hanging over our heads. If we can be sure our sin will find us out, how is it possible for any of us to live in complete freedom and with all-consuming joy? The answer is, those sin exposes us Jesus covers us. If, you, if, if you're an unbeliever, my hope is to share the truth with you today in a loving and in a direct way, trusting that the Holy Spirit might do a miracle, might do a miracle in your heart and make your heart come alive to the truth about the greatness of the glory of Jesus. If you are an unbeliever, covering for your guilt and shame can really come to you. It's a reality. It's true. It comes to you through confession and repentance. In other words, when you confess your sin, you are saying that you agree that what the Spirit has exposed in your heart is sin, and you side with God against your sin. To repent is to turn toward Jesus and away from sin. The miracle of the gospel, the miracle of the gospel is that Jesus has first sided with you in your sin so he could take your sin upon himself and so he could give you his righteousness in exchange. Then, through the Spirit, Jesus declares Not war on you, but with you against your sin. That's the hope of the gospel. First, first Jesus covers you instantly and eternally. Then he changes you. First he justifies you before God. Then he sanctifies you by the Spirit. You don't need to change yourself before you first come to Jesus. (laughs) You could never wash yourself clean enough to be holy in his presence. That is, in the presence of the holiest being in all reality. Rather, Jesus has come to us. Jesus has come to you. All you need to do is respond to him in faith when he calls you, as he is now 
hear the words of your Savior. Come to me. Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Salvation is at hand. Though all people can be sure that our sin will find us out, the believer in Jesus need not fear eternal judgment at all. Not in the slightest. Because God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. Since we have been justified by faith, we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Though it is absolutely true that our sin will find us out. As believers in Jesus, we need not fear any condemnation because Christ Jesus found out each and every one of our sins first. And he took that detailed list of our spiritual debts to Calvary's cross so that he could pay that debt in full. It's as if, it's as if when the Roman soldier drove the nails through his hands, Jesus was was clutching a legal document with a guilty verdict with every one of your sins written on it outlining the precise punishment for each and every sin. When the nail drove through his wrist, it effectively also pinned that paper, that document, to the cross, spattered with the holy, redeeming, and utterly sufficient blood of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 and verse 14. When Jesus was taken down from the cross and buried in the tomb, it's as if that bloody document was still stuck in his fist. But three days later, he walked out of the grave. He crumpled up that paper outlining your death sentence and he tossed it over his shoulder to remain buried in the grave forever. That is the hope of the gospel. Because Jesus killed death, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Jesus turned the vilest death of all time into the means by which countless people would enjoy spiritual life, life, abundant life in his name forever. Or we could say, God preserves his people against sin and evil, even their own, at any cost, even the life of his son because his covenant love is upon his people. And the king rose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther. For he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. As Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, will he even assault the queen in my presence in my house? As, as the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king, said, Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose word saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, 
50 cubits high, that's 75 feet tall. And the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. In 1 Corinthians 10, the Apostle Paul, as, as we have been over the last few weeks, is warning people, he's warning the people of God specifically against idolatry. To do so, he pulls from Israel's history. And he reminds the people that idolatry is what led to their exposure of sin, specifically grumbling and sexual immorality in the desert, which then led to their destruction, a rather dramatic destruction for many of them. But Paul says, now hundreds and hundreds of years later, that these examples were written for our instruction. Therefore, he says... Let anyone who stands take heed or be careful or watch out lest he fall. This this is an illustrative warning because any of us can picture someone standing at a great height and falling to their doom. But in particular in this case, this, this rather illustrative warning to take heed lest a person fall is it's just irresistibly ironic in the case of Haman. So this, this sovereignly orchestrated sequence of events happens fast here. Haman is furious because Mordecai, the Jew, won't fall before him in homage. Out of idolatrous anger, Haman constructs just a, a gargantuan gallows on which to impale Mordecai. Starting with the king's sleepless night in Susa, God acts behind the scenes to turn the tables in dramatic fashion, as we saw last week. Now, Haman's sin has found him out. His sinful actions have exposed him. So Esther fully outs Haman, which ignites the king's anger. So he storms out into the garden. And this is where God's providential hand just kind of pokes through the veil. Verse 8, And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine as Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. The irony is that Haman sought to execute an honorable Jew without mercy for not falling before him in honor. Now, Haman falls before another honorable Jew, begging for mercy to avoid his own execution. In other words, this this fall of Haman perfectly illustrates the fall of Haman. Right? (laughs) The irony is thick. But one of the the more interesting dynamics going on in this particular situation is the utter improbability of Haman falling on the couch here on Esther. Maybe he was just falling down to beg for his life. But that doesn't seem to be the implication, certainly not the case for the king. It wasn't his perspective. Haman's fall onto the couch next to Esther. At the exact moment the the furious king enters the room seems, seems so conspicuously fortuitous. It led one ancient rabbi to speculate whether or not the angel Gabriel may have just given... Haman, a providential push at that exact moment. But in any case, the 
king either just explodes in anger or he sees an expedient way of getting rid of Mordecai to avert a rather messy situation if you think about it because technically, even though Haman initiated it, the king gave approval for the edict that went out across his kingdom. The moment the king accuses Haman, the executioners cover Haman's head. There will be no public defender assigned to him. He has no hope. If the king accuses you, you're dead. One of the eunuchs standing by just so happens to mention there's a 75 foot tall impaling pole, just freshly constructed, standing in Haman's front yard. Now, Haman's head's covered, so you can imagine what he was thinking, or as those words went out, directed towards Harbona. But the reality of the likelihood is, from what we know about Haman, every part of it, he probably hated Haman. It probably didn't bother his conscience at all to remind the king that the gallows was standing in Haman's yard. So the king orders Haman to be impaled on it. The king's wrath is therefore abated. And Haman completes, perhaps, the fastest fall from grace in the history of the human race. (laughs) Remember who Haman is. An ancient adversary. His people are an ancient adversary of the people of God. Remember who he is. In this case, acting as a seed of the serpent, Haman attempted to destroy a righteous Jew by piercing him on a wooden pole. But in a stunning turn of events, that very same instrument of death was the means by which Haman's own destruction was secured. The ancient serpent himself later tried to destroy a far more righteous Jew by piercing him on a wooden pole. But in a stunning turn of events, the same instrument of death became the very means by which Satan's destruction was secured. Colossians 2 and verse 15. Haman's life displays the warning of 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. Take heed lest you fall. It demonstrates it in a dramatic way. Haman did not heed the warning, and he fell hard. But in the context of our passage, what's the specific warning that Haman ignored? Take heed lest you fall is a warning. And I'm saying it's applicable in this case. What's the warning that Haman ignored in the context of our passage? I think much like our painting, all of the dramatic events of Esther 7, the focal points are pointing backward to the edge of the passage, or more specifically back to chapter 6. I mean, we can learn tons about Haman's life and be warned against sin by reading the more obvious aspects of this passage here in chapter 7, but I think we'll ultimately miss the main point of the story if we fail to connect these events to the Marsh Hawk of chapter 6 and verse 13. Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that happened to him. Then his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him, but will surely fall before him. Haman Consider yourself warned. Now, 
first straightforward application from here. If your wife gives you counsel (laughs) consistent with the Bible and you choose to ignore that counsel, there could be very, very severe consequences. (laughs) Had Haman actually listened to Zeresh and had he backed down instead of doubling down, he probably could have survived these two banquets. It's fascinating that Haman ignored his wife's counsel about a righteous Jew, it led to his death, but it also led to the salvation of God's people. How's that for subtle sovereignty? Not only that, but Pontius Pilate ignored his wife's counsel about a certain righteous Jew that he should have nothing to do with. It led to a few problems in Rome, but it also led to the salvation of the entire world. Nonetheless, let's look more closely at what Zeresh actually said. Why would she say, Why would she say that if or since Mordecai is of the Jewish people, you will not overcome him? But you will surely fall before him. Does Zeresh not realize her husband's number two in Persia, the most dominant nation on earth? Why in the world would she say this? Why is she so convinced that her husband and the the nation of Persia cannot stand against a single righteous Jew. What's the answer to the question? There's only one reason she would say that. This pagan wife of a Persian official has heard of the fame of the God of Israel. She's heard the history about a God who protects his people. And she believes it. She wholeheartedly believes it. Interestingly, another woman gives us insight into how other nations felt about Israel. When the spies came into Jericho to view the land, Rahab said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. First of all, that's remarkable. They're not attacking. There's just two spies there who happen to run into Rahab, who is a prostitute. And she says, despite these fortified walls throughout the city, look, I I know the Lord's given this land, our city, into your hand. Why would she say that? I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Amazing. Yahweh's fame, the God of Israel, his fame spanned continents and it crossed generations. Zeresh knew, she believed deep down that Haman could not destroy the people of Israel. 
So here's a stark warning, very similar from the New Testament. Romans 1 tells us that deep down, deep down, all people, all people know, all people know what? All people know that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. But they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What can be known about God is plain to them because he's shown it to them. So they are without excuse, but they don't see fit to acknowledge him. What if that describes you? What if you know deep down you're, you don't trust Jesus? But you know deep down he's your only hope. Because the wrath of God will be revealed from heaven. And so you live in such a way that you suppress the truth, trying to block that reality out of your mind, which means you're not acknowledging God for who he is. If, if that does describe you, then my plea to you is turn at this very moment, repent of your sin, and be rescued by this God. Turn to him. Don't oppose him. You will fall. But he is a loving God, abounding in grace and mercy. So turn to him even now and be saved. If you know deep down you don't trust Jesus, turn to him. Turn to him even now and be saved. Today, today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the favorable time. Rahab and Zeresh, two pagan women who lived a long time ago. One of them was a Persian. The other was a prostitute. They're warning you. They are warning you because they believe the truth about the God of Israel. They're warning you that No one can stand against his wrath. No one can oppose him. Especially if you're opposing God's people. Turn to him. Be saved. The reality is, the reality is, and I say this for the sake of clarity, that if this did describe you, you now have also heard the truth about the God of Israel this morning, which means you also are without excuse. Zeresh is offering a warning in 613, but the marsh hawk, hidden within that verse, is that God promises to preserve his people because of, because of the unrelenting, ever-pursuing covenant love God has for his people. That's why. It's out of his love for his people that God will destroy the enemies of his people. We get that, right? I don't usually walk around town with a Glock thinking, I wonder who I could pick off today. That's a good thing, right? But if you come into my house and threaten the existence of my family, that's all I will be thinking about. And that makes sense. How much more? How much more? The God of Israel. The reason that God promised Abraham that he will bless those who bless you and curse those who dishonor you is because of his covenant love, his covenant love for his people. True Israel is God's treasured possession. God doesn't wipe out those who oppose his people because he hates every other nation on earth. Rather, God loves his own people with such un, unremitting, steadfast love 
that he will not allow them to ultimately be destroyed by anyone. Look, if you don't know the Lord, don't you want to be loved like that? You can be. Turn to Jesus to be rescued from your sins now. If, if the Holy Spirit is moving in your heart, don't let that moment pass. Let's hear it in God's own words. In Exodus 34, when God revealed himself to Moses, he referred to himself as the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding, abounding in steadfast or covenant love and faithfulness. This is who he is. In other words, the ultimate explanation for why Zeresh knew that Mordecai would prevail over her husband was because she believed she believed that the God of Israel loved his people so much he was willing to destroy anyone who opposed them. We know that God loves the nations because the gospel has gone forth to all the nations. Very few of you grew up in the Middle East. <laughs> to my knowledge, almost none of us are Messianic Jews, which means all of us are Gentile converts because the gospel came to the nations, which proves that God loves us. And yet, God won't blink if you oppose his people. Ultimately, there will be eternal consequences. So, let that truth, if you are a believer in Jesus, let that truth embolden your heart this morning as you think about just all of the things that are happening in the culture. All of the things that are, are, are approved and that we are supposed to celebrate and yet we know they are not true as you think about that be reminded that the lord will build his church and the gates of hell never have nor ever will be able to stand against it think about it perhaps even on a more personal level a more individual Level. If you are a believer in Jesus, praise God. Know that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. That is gloriously good news. Now, one final time for the sake of clarity. If you are an unbeliever, let me share the truth of the matter with you. The day of Jesus Christ, to which I just referred, will be the greatest day of all time for those who believe in Jesus. And it is the day that fills unbelievers and even demons in hell with absolute terror and dread. The day of Jesus Christ is a day God will highly exalt Jesus for his willingness to go to the cross to provide salvation for all who call on his name, which could be you this morning. Philippians 2 says that God has bestowed on Jesus the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. On that day, that is on the day of Jesus Christ, on that day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the truth about Jesus. 
for believers. We will fall down in worship and weep tears of unimaginable joy. Every other person in heaven and on earth who has opposed God or his people will fall down, acknowledge the truth about Jesus, and cry tears of unimaginable regret. On that day, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. What you, have, what you have whispered in private rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops and every careless word will be brought into judgment. On that day, for those of us in Christ, for those of us who have trusted in the blood of Jesus, for those of us who have been rescued, who have been rescued by God's great covenant love. On that day, we will sing. And we will sing the sweet sound of saving grace. And we will sing. We will sing without fear. We will sing without any fear of judgment. And we will sing with unhindered, absolutely unhindered joy. That is a day that we are longing for. Praise be to the Father, to his glorious Son, and to the most Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Would you pray with me? So, Spirit of the living God, Spirit, Spirit of the living God, would you, would you now lead your people in worship? Holy Spirit, you are the only one that can penetrate our hearts to the places that need to be penetrated. Lord, would you, would, you, would you shine light and bring forth saving faith this morning in anyone who is, who is not trusted in Jesus? And would you shine light into our doubting hearts? And would you remind us of the truth of who you are? I pray, I pray that as we think about the worthiness, the sufficiency, the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash us whiter than snow, we would have full confidence, full confidence in saving grace so that we might now be able to sing without fear, and without hindrance, in full joy. So lead us to that end, I pray. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen.